the Supreme Moot Court of Dalhousie at Halifax with the Honorable Justice Michael J. Wood, Honorable Justice Robin C. M. Gogan, and Miss Michelle Kelly, now presiding, is open. All persons who have anything to do with it, draw near and give your attendance, and ye shall be heard. God save the Dean. <laughs> Court is now in session. Thank you. Please be seated. Put that on for minutes. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome, everyone, to the 2024 Smith Shield Moot. This is one of the highlights of the academic year at the Schulich School of Law. The Smith Shield Moot is almost 100 years old, beginning as it did in 1927, and it remains um, the law school's most prestigious mooting event. Um, indeed, previous winners of the Smith Shield have included real legal trailblazers, like Justice Ber Bertha Wilson, the first woman to sit on the Supreme Court of Canada, um, as well as other names that might ring a bell to students and guests tonight, including Dean Emeritus William Charles, Dean Emeritus Philip Saunders, Professors Emeriti Bruce Archibald and Wayne McKay, and Professor Steve Coughlin. Our bench this year is comprised of the Honorable Chief Justice Michael J. Wood, Chief Justice of Nova Scotia, the Honorable Justice Robin Gogan of the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal, and Ms. Michelle Kelly, King's Counsel and First Vice President of the Nova Scotia Barrister Society. Uh, I thank each of them for lending their time, efforts, and talents to this event. We are so grateful for um, their support. Uh, thank you also to Stuart McKelvey for funding the Smith Shield Moot. This year's firm representative is Mr. Rory Rogers, King's Counsel and partner at Stuart McKelvey. I also have to thank um, Professor Susie Dunn, who unfortunately um, could not be here tonight, but who I know will watch the recording um, as soon as it's online. Uh, Professor Dunn wrote this year's problem and went really above and beyond in uh, helping our mooters prepare for tonight. Um, just uh, on that point, uh, please note that the event is being audio and video recorded and will be posted on the Schulich Law website. Uh, after the fact, and um, as usual, now is a good time to ensure that your phones and devices are on silent. Thank you as well to Sam Kurlansky, Administrative Coordinator uh, in the Associate Dean Academics Office for her first-rate organi organizational skills and support, and to Elizabeth Sanford in the Dean's Office for the same. Um, after arguments. The judges will retire to the uh, judges conference room to deliberate. They will then return and uh, announce the winners. Following that, uh, photos will be taken of the judges and our mooters and a reception will be held in the faculty lounge on the third floor and everyone is welcome to attend. And now without further ado, I will turn things over to the bench and to our truly exceptional mooters. Alex Harrison, Michelle Maxwell, Rachel McMillan, and Anu Sidhu. Enjoy the show, and thank you. I don't think I've had anyone say enjoy the show before a court session started. <laughs> I must remember that line. All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Supreme Court of Dalhousie. Uh, we're involved in the matter of Derek Chandler as the appellant and Sylvia Vaughn as the respondent. Uh, so, counsel, we're ready to hear from the appellants. Thank you, Justice. Good evening, Chief Justice Wood, Justice Gogan, and Justice Kelly. My name is Mashel Maxwell, and together with my co-counsel, Alex Harrison, we represent the appellant, Mr. Derek Chandler, in this matter. My friends, Rachel McMillan and Anu Sidhu, represent the respondent, Ms. Sylvia Vaughn, and there are two main issues in this appeal. The first is whether the respondent can have a reasonable expectation of privacy in sexualized screenshot images taken by the appellant during a live stream that the respondent hosted for 10 strangers from all across the world as part of her highly successful cam girl business. The appellant submits that she cannot, and accordingly, Justice Awad of the Nova Scotia Supreme Court erred when she concluded otherwise. 
My submissions today will focus on this issue. And the second issue is whether the appellant appropriated the respondent's personality by using some of these screenshots in a book that details his advocacy work against explicit online content, including as it pertains to Ms. Vaughn's business. We submit that Justice Sawad was correct in finding that no such appropriation occurred, and my colleague Ms. Harrison will address this point in greater detail. The underlying facts of this case and its procedural history are not in dispute, but are reproduced for you at paragraph 7 to 26 of the appellant's factum. I would be happy to go through them with you, but if that's not necessary, I propose to move directly into argument. Just proceed with argument. That's fine. If we have factual questions, we'll ask you as your argument unfolds. Certainly. This appeal is about making sure that Nova Scotia's new Intimate Images Act does not extend the long arm of privacy liability to public, for-profit, explicit online content especially when the act is really meant to guard against incursions into one's private sexual life. Accordingly, the act should be construed to prevent transforming the internet from one of the most powerful tools for human connection ever devised into a series of private enclaves. This means finding that a sex worker offering services to the global public via the World Wide Web is someone transacting in public, not someone engaging in fundamentally private activities. It means concluding that the respondent has no reasonable expectation of privacy in her images. As a preliminary matter, I will acknowledge that this appeal is uncharted territory. The Intimate Images Act is a new statute, and this case is the first to ask a Nova Scotia court to interpret the meaning of the phrase reasonable expectation of privacy as it appears there. The act itself creates a tort where a person distributes another's intimate images without consent, and the definition of an intimate image is in section 3F of the act, and that's reproduced for your convenience at paragraph 34 of the appellant's factum. There are essentially two elements in this definition. First, the plaintiff must be depicted in the nude or engaged in sexual activities. All parties agree that this element is met. The second element is whether the image was captured in circumstances giving rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy, and the appellant submits for all the reasons I'll describe later that this element is not met, and accordingly that's why I refer to these images as explicit images, not intimate images. And it is true that the appellant behaved inappropriately when he captured and disseminated these images as part of his advocacy work. But that impropriety does not retroactively create a reasonable expectation of privacy. A contextual consideration of the totality of circumstances operative in this case, as the jurisprudence demands, reveals that none ever existed. And accordingly, I have three submissions for you today, drawing on factors that courts have historically considered essential to this inquiry, which together show you why this is the case. First, the respondent's live stream occurred in a public corner of cyberspace, accessible by the global public and frequented by strangers. None of the meager protection she placed on it does anything to change this fact. Why, this, do, you, why do you describe the protections as meager? Um, so I would like to... Uh, I, I can move directly into that, I suppose. So Ms. Vaughn really only has uh, two screening criteria for her... Uh, for her website. First, individuals must not personally know her, and second, they must not be currently in Nova Scotia. Um, you could be somebody who lives a block away from Ms. Vaughn, go on vacation in PEI, uh, and still be able to access her content. Uh, the website is also publicly searchable, uh, otherwise the Clean Screens member from British Columbia wouldn't have been able to access it. Um, and the website itself hosts 50 people, not just 10. Uh, and so Ms. Vaughn really is opening up her windows, uh, to the, use the language of the Milner case cited in my factum, to a nebulous collection of the global public, uh, including strangers from Uruguay and Uganda. The website also grows via globalized word of mouth advertising uh, as uh, individuals uh, communicate about Ms. Vaughn's services. She also uh, removes users who are not uh, active. And we don't know how often Ms. Vaughn removes individuals, but Ms. Vaughn's business functions on tips. Uh, so she has an incentive to really remove anybody who is not actively engaging with her content. Um, and then when the website itself starts, when she clicks begin on a live stream, uh, she's not selective about the 10 individuals who enter the site, just the first 10 to appear. Uh, and I would like to bring you to paragraph 55 of my factum. Uh, and in particular, the case of R.V. Hughes. Uh, in that case, there were protections on a website. Uh, it encountered, there was a firewall, first of all. You had to download a specialized program called BitTorrent to access it. You also had to have some tech savviness to access this uh, 
portion of the dark web because its purpose was sharing uh, illegal images. And yet, the court said that uh, because the purpose of the website was sharing explicit content with strangers, with some segment of the public, uh, no reasonable expectation of privacy arose. And I think it's important to note that not only are the protections greater in the Hughes case, Hughes is a criminal case. It deals with Section 8. It deals with uh, protecting individual privacy from incursions of the state, which is a heightened inquiry than when ordinary individuals are, uh, incur are intruding on your privacy. And yet, the court concluded that no reasonable expectation of privacy existed. Um, Can so I just ask you, though, Mr. Maxwell, so I, I read the Hughes case, and that is very helpful your to your position, but your <clears throat> the opposite side, the respondents have highlighted the Griffin and Sullivan case. And that's also a case where there were limits placed on the website. In that case, it wasn't 50 members that could be participatory and 10 at a time. It was 50 to 100 regular users and 500 infrequent users. And that case found that those protections were enough to put it in the private sphere instead of the public sphere. So, so how do you rationalize that civil case as opposed to the criminal case that you've just highlighted for us? So uh, as I've said, this an analytical framework is contextual. You're looking at all the factors. You're looking uh, at place, uh, and you're also looking at the nature of the information being shared. So in the Griffin case, what was being shared was personal mental health information. Uh, and that's to be contrasted with the information being shared in this case, which is commercial sexual performance imagery. Uh, and to that point, I think it would be useful to take you to actually my, my second submission, uh, which is at paragraph 68 to 73 of the appellant's factum. Um, so it's very clear, uh, the Supreme Court has said a number of times, including in Cole, that the uh, more personal and intimate the information, uh, the greater the privacy interest. And while I agree with my friend that sexual information generally falls in this biographical core, uh, it's important to remember context as well. So I particularly uh, remind you of the Airy case, a 2023 British Columbia Court of Appeals civil decision, where uh, what was at stake was ordinarily anodyne information, ordinarily uh, something like names, addresses, but because these, uh, uh, these things were shared with the purpose of targeting justice system employees, it became confidential, it became intimate. And so the opposite is also clearly true, where somebody shares information in a way that indicates publicity, regardless of whether that information is sexual in nature, uh, a reasonable expectation of privacy cannot attach. And that's exactly what we see in the Milner case, which is a 2005 decision from the British Columbia Supreme Court. Uh, and in Milner, what was at issue was uh, an individual in their home opened up their uh, curtains, and uh, an insurance investigator was able to observe the goings-on there. Ordinarily, we have an incredibly high privacy interest in our home. It's one of the highest interests protected by law. But because this person, uh, the context of sharing was opening these, uh, opening these curtains, uh, the reasonable expectation of privacy was lost. Um, does that answer your question, Justice? The, uh, I have a question as well. I hope that he answered yours. Um, so the reasonable expectation of privacy, it seems to me, and if I, if I don't state the law correctly, you, you let me know. Um, it starts with the proposition that you need the person to have a subjective expectation of privacy as a starting point, and that subjective expectation has to be objectively reasonable. Do you agree that that's what is meant by a reasonable expectation of privacy? Uh, I would say in the criminal context, that's traditionally how it's okay, been interpreted. So how does, do you think it's different in this statute? I think that um, there, there has not been a, a, a substantial body of law here. I think that a subjective expectation of privacy is necessary but insufficient. Um, I think that the totality of the circumstances have to show whether the uh, reasonable expectation of privacy is, uh, okay. is objectively so did reasonable. Did Ms. Vaughn have a subjective expectation of privacy in this Ms. Vaughn uh, may have had a subjective expectation of privacy, uh, but our submission is that Ms. Vaughn did not take the steps necessary to render this expectation objectively reasonable. Uh, and simply, Ms. Vaughn is, is a performer. Uh, she is a 
competent economic actor who's decided to start a business, and accordingly that comes with reputational risks. She might take some steps to uh, protect and insulate her privacy, but in this case those steps weren't reasonable because she was sharing content with a nebulous collection of strangers. But why then impose any restrictions on access at all then? Uh, I, I think potentially uh, Ms. Vaughan's uh, decision to restrict access is something that I can't necessarily speak to, but uh, it, it's a good business strategy to, uh, to keep the, uh, the nature uh, or the number of individuals smaller. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that Ms. Vaughan is uh, taking no steps to protect her privacy. She was clearly concerned about uh, individuals that she knew uh, seeing her images. But in this circumstances, they're not objectively reasonable. And I think it might be useful to bring you to paragraphs 51 and 52 of the Appellant's Factum, uh, where I deal with the, the cases of Zaloni and Truong. So uh, Zaloni is a 2021 Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench civil decision, and Truong is a 2021 uh, Alberta Court of Queen's Bench criminal decision. Uh, Zaloni deals with observation in a uh, condominium entry hallway and um, Truong deals with recordings made in a uh, hotel hallway. And in both cases, uh, this is a circumstance where people have some privacy expectation. You know, there are some people who are barred from entering a hotel hallway. But in both cases, the respective courts concluded that these spaces do not have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And that's because they're open to this highly variable uh, segment of individuals. And it's not the fact that, you know, everybody in the world can observe you in a space that renders it uh, public. It's the fact that a segment of the public, which is, uh, you know, significantly large or significantly variable, can access the space, can um, observe you. So moving back to my submissions at paragraph 68 to 73, uh, which deal with the nature of the information itself, uh, I would like to draw a distinction between private intimate sexual imagery and public sexual performance imagery. Um, so what is at issue here is the privacy interest in a performance, not a private sexual act. Well, let me, let me just uh, challenge you on that for a second, counsel. The act, spe the act speaks about the image, mm -hmm. not the performance. So the image in this case is the screenshot. That's what we're talking about, right? So the issue isn't whether she had a privacy expectation in her performance. The issue is whether she had a privacy expectation in the screenshot that was prepared, right? So the language of the act uh, is that the image is taken in circumstances giving rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy. Reasonable expectation of privacy in respect of the image. In respect of the image, yes. So but she that had to be... A, expecting that the image, which we now are describing as a screenshot, um, would be private. So why don't, with all the protection she has about you're not allowed to record, you have to sign and agree to the terms, doesn't that send a pretty clear message that she expected there to be no screenshots and if someone took a screenshot that that information was expected to be private? So that, that's clearly her subjective expectation. Isn't that objectively reasonable, given the information on the website? No, I, I would submit that it's not. Um, so I would direct you to the um, Silber and BCTV case, uh, which I can find the, the reference for you here. Um, at paragraphs 57 to 59 is where I deal with it. So yes, I concede that Mr. Chandler breach the terms and rules of, uh, of Ms. Vaughn's website. Uh, and to sort of address your earlier point, uh, yes, ultimately the privacy expectation is in the image, but that's informed by the circumstances in which it's captured. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's uh, something that we see, for example, in, in the Jarvis case. But uh, bring you to paragraphs 57 to 59, uh, the fact that the appellant violated the rules of a space uh, does not on its own create the reasonable expectation of privacy. So in Silber, the plaintiff explicitly said to a news crew that they were not allowed to enter his property, they were not allowed to record, uh, and they were not allowed to film the, the labor dispute there. He did it anyway, and uh, later disseminated those recordings. 
and there was no reasonable expectation of privacy in those recordings because they were taken uh, in a space that the public could observe, just like the website. Well, again, Mr. Maxwell, like, I, I don't like your characterization of that because the public can't observe it. You have to be uh, granted permission to observe it twice. Once as the, as the qualifying 50 people that she puts on the list. And then I do take your point, it's a correct one, that, that then you have to be one of the first 10 people to sign in. A and so I don't understand how you get around the fact that this isn't a, a public space. It, it is a private space. And I, I'd like to give you a hypothetical. Um, we have these cases that have been cited in your factum and the respondent's factum about intimate images that are shared amongst partners, sexual partners, and then there's a breakup and, and the image goes further. In this case, isn't it alike to the fact that Ms. Vaughn had 10 sexual partners that night? She shared an image of herself with 10 sexual partners and then they disseminated it further. Like, isn't that the exact same thing we're talking about here? Uh, so I would push back on, on that. Um, to your first point, um, this is somewhat identical to the street in Milner and the uh, parking lot in Silber. The fact is that Ms. Vaughn is not particularly selective about the 50 people she lets into the website. There are, you know, in this sort of small uh, suburban shopping center, probably a, a similar number of people. Same with the uh, suburban street in, uh, in Milner. Uh, and with respect to Ms. Vaughn having 10 sexual partners, I would like to bring you to paragraph 60 to 67 of the appellant's factum. Um, the fact is that Ms. Vaughn is not in a relationship of trust and confidentiality akin to the kind of relationships that we traditionally see in the non-consensual disclosure jurisprudence. Uh, I'd first bring up the case of Her Majesty and TA, uh, which it stands for the proposition that where information is shared in, uh, in circumstances where uh, there's a relationship of trust and confidentiality, that points towards a reasonable expectation of privacy. And when it's shared with strangers, that points away from a reasonable expectation of privacy. And that's exactly what Ms. Vaughn is doing. She's sharing her content with a collection of internet strangers uh, who access her website. And it's not reasonable for her to expect them to keep it close to the vest. Um, and I'd also like to uh, say that this is the, the kind of thing, uh, these relationships of trust and confidentiality, that is. They are the kinds of relationships that this act is really meant to protect. So directing you to the, uh, the Roque and Peters case, the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench decision, uh, and the Shillington case, that, those courts really hit home that uh, what the violation was in this case was this breach of a close relationship of trust and confidentiality. And I don't uh, submit, as my, my friend characterizes it, that these relationships of trust and confidentiality can only subsist in intimate relationships, uh, just that the relationship must be one of trust and confidentiality. And the fact is that Ms. Vaughn's relationship with her patrons is one of commerce and estrangement. Uh, more similar to the Milton case, the 1988 British Columbia Supreme Court decision, where an individual shared uh, an intimate image with a drugstore clerk and accordingly lost the reasonable expectation of privacy. I see that I'm running low on time, so I just uh, rely on the remainder of my factum uh, for the balance of my submissions, and I will move to conclude. To sum up, the contextual factors at play in this case show that the respondent has no reasonable expectation of privacy in her images. She chose to operate a public-facing business on the internet using a website that was accessible by most of the world. She shared explicit content with individuals with whom she had no relationship of trust and confidentiality. And the content of the images themselves is public sexual performance imagery and is neither intimate nor confidential. This court should exercise caution in drawing the line between the public and private spheres in this case, allowing the respondent a competent and sophisticated economic actor to use the Intimate Images Act as a shield for her public facing venture perverts the purpose of the act and unwittingly sends the message that even public-facing sex work must be banished to the private sphere. Accordingly, you should allow the appeal. Subject to any questions, those are my submissions, and I'll turn it over. Oh, am I five minutes? <laughs> oh, my. Okay, well, we can get into it. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> well, now we have lots. <laughs> Let the show begin. <laughs> So I do have a question that I was 
that I, that I was thinking of asking until you told me you didn't have enough time. So um, I'm going to draw kind of a different, a slightly different example from the one that Justice Kelly posed. Um, I think we can all recognize that when we go into change rooms in public pools and athletic facilities, there's signs that say no cell phones permitted. And there's people there in various stages of undress, including in the, in the family change rooms, kids of all genders and ages. Um, if someone were to take, contrary to the rules, a cell phone image in a change room, where someone is exposing themselves to all sorts of strangers who, and they're comfortable doing that in the circumstances, uh, does that person who takes the image with their cell phone and then distributes it, do they run afoul of this, of this legislation? Uh, certainly they do. That would be a case of voyeurism, which is firmly... But would, they also be con would it also be contrary to this legislation? Certainly. It, it would be... But so it what's be the difference between the example I gave you and the example and the factual situation we're dealing with here, where she, uh, Ms. Vaughn, did undress or expose herself to, to strangers, but she was happy to do that on the condition that they didn't record it or use it for any other purpose? So I, I think the... Uh That's a good question, and I think the distinction here is that what you have in this public pool scenario uh, is this essentially private enclave, uh, a change room where uh, you know you you are with strangers, but with a uh, where where everybody's undressed, everybody uh, sort of agrees that this is a a space where individuals uh, aren't recording versus the internet, which is sort of the wild west here. Um, and the key distinction is that Ms. Vaughn is, you know, revealing herself via, you know, a video platform to a number of strangers for sexual purposes, uh, which is distinct from uh, somebody, you know, just getting undressed and then not expecting to be recorded. Uh, so I think the distinction to be drawn is between the voyeurism issue and between uh, willingly sharing explicit content with strangers. Um, I, I have sort of motored through my submission, so if you have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. I have one last question. Yes. This idea that um, you reference, you know, to find in this situation a breach of the act would delegitimize sex workers. Why would it delegitimize sex workers? Would it not empower sex workers to know that the law is actually protecting them? So, no, uh, for a few reasons. Um, so there are sex workers who legitimately conduct business in private. Uh, a great example might be an escort who goes to somebody's private hotel room. And of course, if that person has a, uh, a screenshot or a a photograph taken of them and that's subsequently distributed, then this act obviously protects that. What we're seeing here is a website that is public facing uh, and where the respondent willingly shares information with a segment of the public. And to say that that, I, I, listen, the, the respondent is a competent economic actor, she's a business person and sex work is a business uh, like any other. And to say that where that transaction occurs in public and it's sexual, there's this uh, privacy interest that it attaches is really saying that this business is not like other businesses. It's one where special protections attach. And that suggests that even where sex work is something that occurs in a public facing venue, uh, it's, uh, it's confined to this private sphere. And uh, to my point where I, I draw on Chahil in, uh, paragraphs uh, 68 to 73 of my factum, where uh, I'm saying that what's being recorded are the details of a transaction occurring in public. And my friend submits that this is fundamentally different because uh, in Chahil it was airline information rather than sexual information. I think the fact is that sex work is work. Um, commerce is commerce. It doesn't matter if the commercial information is sexual rather than uh, dealing with uh, airline information. Uh, and to draw that distinction is to say that this kind of work can only occur in the private realm. Uh, so subject to any more questions, those are my submissions. 
I encourage this court to uh, allow the appeal with costs, and I'll turn it over to my co-counsel, Ms. Harrison. Thank, Thank you very much. Would I be able to clarify with the timekeeper how much time we have for submissions? There's two minutes remaining. Submissions in 20 for you to time stops and ask questions. Lovely, thank you. Good evening, Chief Justice Wood, Justice Kelly, Justice Gauguin. As my co-counsel mentioned, I will be speaking to the issue of appropriation of personality and whether or not the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia erred in finding that the appellant, Mr. Chandler, did not wrongfully appropriate the personality of the respondent, Ms. Vaughn. The tort of appropriation of personality is about the proprietary interest in personality. The tort protects an individual's exclusive right to market their personality for commercial gain and provides recourse only when an unauthorized commercial use of personality amounts to an exploitation. However, this individual proprietary right is not absolute. It must be balanced against the public interest. Since this tort was first recognized in 1973, the courts have continuously noted the obvious dangers of overextending it. Placing severe limits on the use of personality has the potential to stifle contributions to cultural enrichment, to curb public debate of social issues, and to dilute content available for public consumption. All of this is to say that at a certain point, giving too much weight to the individual un unduly infringes against the public interest in the freedom of expression. At its core, this appeal requires the court to determine if the circumstances of the, this case present strong policy reasons. And your counsel, um, when you talk about freedom of expression, you're talking about your client's freedom of expression, correct? In the context of this case? Correct, Justice yeah. Wood, my okay. client's freedom of expression. As opposed to Ms. Vaughn's freedom of expression. Correct. Is her freedom of expression infringed by the actions of your client? The appellant would submit that Ms. Vaughn's freedom of expression is definitely involved and engaged by my client's actions, but we submit that it is not infringed the way that the general public freedom of expression would be infringed in allowing this appeal. More specifically, this court must determine if the appellant's use of the respondent's personality, featuring her name and image on the cover of a book which features a short chapter related to her, is the kind of use that this tort is aimed at guarding against. The appellant submits that a finding of appropriation of personality in this case would shift the balance of rights too far toward the individual. The three elements of the tort are set out at paragraph 82 of the appellant's factum. My friend and I are in agreement that the facts of the case satisfy the first two elements of the tort. As such, my submissions will be focused on the issue of commercial gain and how failure on this element moves the appellant's use of the respondent's personality outside of the ambit of the tort. To make this determination, I will first establish that the respondent is a person of public interest and I will then address how the respondent's use of, the, of or how the use of the respondent's personality, one, fell into a protected category of use, and two, how it was for a charitable purpose. I will now move to my first submission, focused on how the respondent was a person of public interest. The respondent unquestionably holds some status as a person of public interest. This is predicated on her strong virtual presence online as a result of her live streaming business. Does that description apply to anyone with an online presence? Justice, this business, like any follower-based activity, is characterized by a dedicated audience who subscribe to content in a niche area, which is produced on a regular basis. This is what distinguishes Ms. Vaughn from any person with an online business. These so is it, the, so is it the business aspect that makes a difference? Because there's, there's lots of people that have online presence, albeit perhaps not for commercial purposes, but would they all be considered public figures from your perspective? Or is it something about the business of Ms. Vaughn that, that puts her in that category? With respect, Justice, I f we submit that it is the capacity for Ms. Vaughn's personality to be commercially exploited, commercially appropriated, that is what moves her into a separate category. This could be something equivalent to others that have achieved internet fame, like TikTok stars or YouTube streamers, any online persona or person who has achieved 
a kind of new age modern celebrity status online. Miss Vaughn? But isn't it like, I'm just thinking, you know, like her whole um, raison d'etre was that she didn't want anyone in Nova Scotia to even know she was doing this. So, so does that affect your submission in any way that like she put up barriers to try and make it so that no one in Nova Scotia knew that this was happening? I feel my co-counsel has adequately addressed how Ms. Vaughn's community is the entirety of the online global web. And with respect, Justice, there's nothing on the facts to categorize Ms. Vaughn as, exclu er, as excluding a large audience in totality. There's nothing to suggest how often the respondent was live streaming sessions, how many months or years she'd been doing this for, or even how many of her viewers in each session were non-returning viewers. There's nothing to establish the kind of relationship she had with her clients. My but there, friend, but, uh, sorry, uh, counsel, but there is certainly evidence uh, in the record that that clearly establishes that she intended to have restrictions on the number of viewers, and she carefully crafted her um, website in order to protect or or to restrict access, even though anybody searching the web could potentially find her. Not everybody could access or view, and even those that could view had to agree to the restrictions that she was setting out. Justice, again, I would refer to my co-counsel's argument where he established that those requirements really created a subjective view of privacy in Ms. Vaughn's personality, and, or in, excuse me, in Ms. Vaughn's uh, performance or imagery. But I, I think it's important to remember that that expectation of privacy and those requirements don't necessarily negate the fact that she was a person of public interest who had achieved this kind of internet fame. She's clearly engaged in an online activity through which she has achieved this fame, so much so that she has been able to achieve a full-time job through this live streaming business. This fame that she's created through her business extends to her both personally as Sylvia Vaughn and as a professional sex worker. As an individual, she is interesting because of the air of mystery she creates during her live stream. Her viewers know nothing about her except what she chooses to share during those live streams. They may not know what she sounds like, they don't know where she, who she is or where she's from, anything of those biographical core details about her. Plus, the fact that subscribers are restricted to consuming her sexually explicit content at specific times and exclusively online adds this level of secrecy to her as an individual. People are inherently curious about sex, and they're curious about Miss Vaughn as an individual. And on that point, I'd like to direct you to paragraph 104 and 105 of the Appellant Factum, where, I, where we draw comparisons to the cases of Gould Estate and Stoddart Publishing Co. and Wiseau and Harper. In both of these cases, the plaintiffs were a person of public interest who had achieved a, a fame in a niche content area with a dedicated audience. They produce content like Miss Vaughn on a regular basis. In Gould Estate, there is a, cl a classical pianist who is famous and featured in a book. I will discuss this in more detail later. And in Wiseau, there was an actor, producer, star of a cult following film, The Room. Both of these individuals had garnered an intense amount of fame and were interesting as individuals. The respondent is also interesting as a worker because of the very fact that she's engaged in sex work. Sex work is a topic that attracts a lot of public debate and discussion because of the range of differing opinions. It's top of mind and something that attracts general public interest, and the respondent is a representation of that profession. I will now move to my second submission, focus on how the appellant's use falls into a protected category. The decision in the Gould Estate case I just mentioned, which is a 1996 case from the Ontario Court of Justice, is very instructive on this topic. It was the first time that the court drew an explicit distinction between the types of use of personality. The court created one category where a personality is used without being the focus of the work. It's used incidentally to the primary purpose, and the work itself is not genuinely related to the individual. The court also created a second category, where the personality is used because it is the focus of the work. The court held that works under this category were to be considered protected uses of personality because the manner of the use was in the public interest. The court explained that the scope of this category included subject matter that extended beyond what was just considered newsworthy, and also captured content that was factual, historical, educational, and even entertaining and amusing. 
The appellant submits that Mr. Chandler's use of the respondent's personality on the cover and within the book falls into this category. First, the updated book cover was used to depict or illustrate the general profession of sex work, a topic which we have submitted is in the public interest because of the debate that surrounds it. The appellant used the respondent's image and name in a very illustrative way, a very clever way, to represent the profession on the cover of the book. He deliberately chose to use a black box, a symbol that is synonymous with censorship and explicit content, to cover the sensitive regions of Ms. Vaughn's body. He accomplished this representation in a very tasteful way. Why did he need to show her face? Couldn't he, couldn't he have uh, made the same point by, but also make it anonymous so people couldn't identify her? Yes, Justice. There is the possibility that our client could have included her image on the cover without displaying her face. But the cover of the book also served a secondary purpose of connecting the appellant's discussion of the sexually explicit visual content online in his chapter which was his personal discussion of his interaction with Ms. Vaughn. My friend would liken that use of the respondent's image to a commercial prop. With respect, we submit that this is more akin to a visual aid. It guides the reader to the fact that the book included content both about sexually explicit vis visual material that's found online and particular details about the respondent, whom we have submitted as a person of public interest. It's in this sense that it serves a dual function. And I would be okay with that if there was more on the cover of the book. And you've brought us to the Gould case. And, and in that case, did the whole decision not hinge on the fact that the cover of the book outlined exactly what was happening? This was a biography of this pianist. I think he was a pianist. Thank yeah. um, <laughs> you. Um, and not an autobiography. Whereas in this case, the appellant put Ms. Vaughn's photo and Ms. Vaughn's name and nothing else on the cover of that book. So how do you distinguish that? And how can you say that this illustration was clever in the sense that it was just pointing the reader to this chapter in the book? Wasn't it saying the whole book was about Ms. Vaughn? With respect, Justice, I don't think that that is the message that's communicated to the consumer. While it is unusual to have an image on the cover of a book with just a single name, we submit that it is not plausible for the consumer to extrapolate that that book is about that particular individual wholly, and let alone that it was written by that book, or excuse me, by that individual. I would also like to point out that, or suggest to you that the case in Gould and the case at Barr really isn't so different. For one thing, the lengths of the two works were quite similar, especially when you consider the text in isolation. The chapter is also not entirely disconnected to the rest from the rest of the book, bringing me back to my submission about how the cover serves that dual purpose. It's still part of a cohesive piece. But just, your, I mean, your proposition, I guess, the, report, the portion of your argument you're dealing with now is the idea that Ms. Vaughn was a sufficiently public persona that she should fall into this uh, sort of exempt uh, category, correct? Correct. And so... When I hear about someone like Glenn Gould, who I'm old enough to know who he is and what his, uh, his history was, he was incredibly famous. He was on television all the time. He was known across the country. He performed internationally. I mean, his individual exposure to the public at large, what seems to me was quite a bit greater than whatever exposure Ms. Vaughn had. She had the tool of the internet, which made it theoretically possible that more people could hear about her, but with the limits we've already talked about, 50 members in total, 10 at a time, uh, I wouldn't put her public exposure, in my mind at least, anywhere near the same category as someone like Glenn Gould or even an actor in a film. So where is the line? When does someone's presence, particularly on the internet, cross from being private to being sufficiently public that they've lost any right to control what happens to their image. With respect, Justice, I don't think it's fair to categorize the Glenn Gould case and the case at Barr in the same way. And I think it is important to illustrate and highlight that difference between the fact that Glenn Gould didn't have the benefit of the inter internet and Ms. Vaughn does. It's a key element on the facts and a key component to our argument here. The fact that she was 
conducting her business online is what moves her past that threshold. Okay, so let's ask the internet question, which I asked you at the end, which is where does someone's, what's the line? How do we determine when someone who has an online presence of any type crosses from being a private person to one whose persona can be used uh, for commercial purposes by anybody? I think the answer to that question, Justice, is in the characterization of what creates a kind of modern new age celebrity. Returning to those three criteria of a dedicated audience and a niche content area that, where content is produced on a regular basis. It is that existence of a public interest. It is not relevant to this issue, the scale of that public interest. It is the existence of the interest in Ms. Vaughn, both as that individual and as a representation of the profession of sex work that moves her over that threshold. I'd like to direct you to paragraphs 100 and 101 of the Appellant's Factum, where a comparison is drawn to the case of Krauss and Chrysler Canada, a 1973 Ontario Court of Appeal case, where the respondent was a professional football player featured in an advertisement for a product called the Spotter. The ad showed an action shot of Krauss and demonstrated how the Spotter was used to identify players by jersey number. It could be focused on a player in the game and using a spinning roster of names and numbers they could be identified. In this case, the court held that the use of the image was for an illustrative purpose, in this case to illustrate a professional game of football, and it, that it did not amount to wrongful appropriation. The court held that the purpose of using this image was not to draw attention to a particular individual player, but rather to depict the game of football and the usefulness of the spotter. I would like to draw your particular attention to the fact that Mr. Krauss in this image, like Ms. Vaughn on the cover of our book, is identifiable by name and an identifying feature which is the number which we submit is equivalent to the face of a sex worker. The facts of this case are similar in other ways too. Like Krauss, the respondent is identify excuse me, as I mentioned, the respondent is identifiable by name and image on the cover of the book. But the purpose of using this image was not to draw attention to a, the particular individual sex worker alone, but rather to in tandem depict the explicit content that emerges from the profession of sex work. It is also critical for this court to remember the totality of the appellant's use of the respondent's personality and not to consider the two uses on the cover and the chapter in isolation. These two uses must be considered together. I'd now like to turn to a chapter, uh, discussion of the purpose of the chapter of the book, which was to provide an anecdotal example of the appellant's firsthand experience with Ms. Vaughn. The content of the book was focused on Ms. Vaughn. Uh, excuse me, the content of the chapter was focused on Ms. Vaughn, who we have submitted as a person of public interest. I've already drawn your attention to two instances where the courts have ruled works like these ought to be protected by public interest, works that are focused on a particular individual. In Gould, as I mentioned, the defendant had authored a 26-page book that had immortalized Gould using photos and interview materials he'd collected many years earlier. And that cover of the book featured a photo of Mr. Gould performing. In the end, the court held that that book fell into the protected category of uses because there was a public interest in learning more about a Canadian musician. The facts here are similar. The appellant has authored a short chapter that provides insight to the respondent and her profession. The cover of the book features her image. We submit, therefore, that the appellant's book ought to fall into the protected category of uses because there is a similar public interest in learning more about the profession of sex work and about Sylvia Vaughn as an individual. What's the public interest in learning more about her as an individual? I understand the interest in learning more about sex work, but what's the interest in learning more about her? Justice, the interest in learning more about Ms. Vaughn as an individual is based in this air of mystery that she creates. Again, I would direct your attention to Wiseau at paragraph 105, where the film and the individual both acquired a cult-like following and a cult-like popularity. The court in this, held, in this case held that the documentary created by the defendant that was explaining the public interest in Mr. Wiseau and the creation of his film was beyond the scope of the tort because the public interest in the mysterious man behind its creation raised it past that threshold. Similarly, a key element of the appellant's chapter related to the, respond related to the respondent is to delve into the mystery and the intrigue that surrounds the persona of Sylvia Vaughn. But is that fair? I mean, isn't the whole purpose of the book to say, let's not let people do this? Like, did I miss that? But isn't it like that 
this guy wants to get out there that we should shut down these types of sites so that our youth and people aren't, you know, unnecessarily exposed to them or exposed to them at all. Like, like, am I not getting what the book was intended to do? With respect, Justice, the fact that it draws public interest to Ms. Sylvia Vaughn does not matter if it is a positive acclade of her work or if it's a critique. The fact is that, that there is public interest in her as an individual learning more about what it is that she did, no matter the perspective of the consumer, and learning more about the profession of sex work, again, no matter the perspective of the consumer. But that goes back to, you know, um, Chief Justice's question earlier about then why do you need to use her face and her name? Again, with respect, Justice, I would, I would draw you to the dual purpose that the book cover serves and that while there is public interest in her as an individual, which is why her face is featured on the book, and at the same time because she illustrates the profession of sex work. I would now like to move to my third submissions, focused on how the appellant had a charitable objective. The most instructive case in discussing the issue of a charitable objective is the Horton and Tim Donut Limited case, which was a 1997 case affirmed at the Ontario Court of Appeal. In fact, it's the only case that conclusively deals with the issue of a charitable objective. My friend makes reference to the Saleh and Barr case, a 2003 decision from the Court of Queen's Bench of Alberta. But it is important to, for this court to remember that this case only decided an interim injunction against the plaintiff and it did not draw any conclusive points on how a charitable objective impacts a finding of wrongful appropriation of personality. Returning to Horton, set out at paragraph 111 of the appellant's factum, it is fortunate that a clear parallel can be drawn between the facts of that case and the case at bar. In order to make that comparison, I'll briefly set out the facts of Horton. The case involved a portrait of the famous hockey player, actually the fourth in a series, which was commissioned to be displayed in his stores. The portrait featured an image of Tim Horton, a blurb about his hockey career, and another blurb about his legacy. It was decided that this portrait would also be reproduced as poster prints, and that the proceeds from this sale would be directed to the Children's Foundation, which was a registered charity. It's imperative to point out that there was nothing on the posters that indicated this charitable intent to the consumer. As I mentioned, the facts in Horton are almost completely analogous to the case at Barr. The appellant included an image of the respondent, albeit with her name, and he authored a short chapter that described aspects of her career and her life. Is Clean Screen a registered charity? Just as it is not a registered charity, but the well, appellant... Isn't that a distinguishing factor? The appellant submits that there's no meaningful or consequential difference between a donation made to a charity and a donation made to a non-profit. Both to, efforts... To a non-profit advocacy group. It was, in fact, a non-profit adv advocacy so, group. So someone, whatever their cause may be, good or bad, people have different opinions about advocacy groups, any advocacy group would be entitled to use any person's image as, uh, for fundraising purposes and not run afoul of this tort. The is, that, is that what you're saying? The appellant submits that any advocacy group that's aimed at making a positive contribution in their community and bringing light to issues that affect individuals would not run afoul of But sometimes that's a matter of perspective and opinion. The Association of Sex Workers might not think this advocacy group is doing anything that's in the public interest. That is correct, Justice, but that is a matter for the, this court to determine whether or not the clean screen so, organization. So we, so we need to decide whether this, the objectives of this organization are charitable in nature? We urge you to follow the precedent set in Tim Horton and to draw... But that the was a registered charity. Excuse me, sorry? That was a registered charity. So this is not a registered charity. And we so urge my you to... So my question is, are, do we need to find that it was akin to a charity in order to accept this argument? This court needs to find that there is no consequential difference between the two organizations. It does not have to be akin to a charity, as much so that it needs to be able to further those contributions to the community and have a philanthropic objective at its core. In Horton, that philanthropic objective was to provide economically disadvantaged kids with a camp experience. In this case, the philanthropic objective was to engage in the public debate about sex work by contributing a work that advocated against the sexually explicit content online. With all this in mind, the facts of this case are not distinguishable from Horton. There is a very clear parallel that I urge you to find between the philanthropic intention and the act of donating proceeds toward that objective. This is exactly the kind of use that the courts have shown they want to protect in cases like Gould, Bozo, and Horton. 
because it is in the public interest and because it is for the good of the community. In the interest of time, I'd like to move to my conclusion. The appellant's argument rests on the fact that the use of the respondent's personality is the kind of use that this court ought to protect. This is for two reasons. First, the use engages the public interest because it contributes information to debate of social issues and entertainment value. Second, both the book and the proceeds were directed to a philanthropic objective of contributing to advocacy and to the community. The courts have continuously shown unease in expanding the tort of appropriation of personality to cover works that further these objectives, and allowing this appeal would be antithetical to the caution the courts have historically exhibited in this area. The result would be an abrupt and substantial change to the common law and an unreasonable disruption to the community at large. Moreover, personality and privacy rights would be given too strong a protection, and it would necessarily infringe the freedom of expression. This would leave the court to grapple with how to refine the scope of the tort in even more complicated circumstances. Allowing this appeal would not represent progress in the law. In fact, it would disaccord with the protection of freedom of expression and radically restrict the kinds of contributions that incorporate any aspect of personality. In short, it would undermine the public interest use of personality, it would obscure the purpose of the tort, and it would not reflect an incremental change in the law. For these reasons, the court should dismiss the appeal. Thank you very much, Ms. Harrison. All right, we're ready to hear from the respondents. Good evening, Justices. As a small preliminary matter, and with your permission, I'm wondering if we could ask the timekeeper to run the time through the questions that we receive, if you have any this evening. Good evening, Chief Justice Wood, Justice Gogan, and Justice Kelly. My name is Rachel McMillan, and I'm appearing on behalf of the respondent, Ms. Sylvia Vaughn, along with my co-counsel, Anu Sidhu. Ms. Sidhu will be addressing the issue of whether or not Mr. Chandler is liable for the tort of appropriation of personality. And I will be focusing my submissions on whether or not Ms. Vaughn had a reasonable expectation of privacy over her live-streamed image. This issue may explain what is at stake in this case, and that is the ability of women and all individuals to control who sees their body and who can be privy to their sexual expression. This case is also the court's first meaningful opportunity to interpret the Intimate Images and Cyber Protection Act, or the Act as I will refer to it. The Act creates a statutory cause of action for victims of the non-consensual distribution of intimate images. And it is not in dispute in this case that Mr. Chandler used deception to gain access to Ms. Vaughn's images. He used a VPN to get around her location-based controls. He used a fake name to ensure that his registration would be accepted. He read and agreed to her explicit terms of use that prohibited screenshots and asked that users be discreet about what they saw. And nonetheless, he went on to view a live stream and screenshot that live stream and send those images to staff at Ms. Vaughn's son's school. The only remaining issue on this tort then is whether or not Ms. Vaughn had a reasonable expectation of privacy over those images and whether she fits the definition of an intimate image and therefore can benefit from the act's protections. It is the position of Ms. Vaughn that these protections should not only be extended to those who are in romantic and monogamous relationships. I wish to focus my submissions on three distinct points this evening. The first is the overarching legal principle that must guide the court in this case. And that is that a loss of control or exposure to some amount of risk does not negate one's reasonable expectation of privacy. Second, I will focus on the location in which Ms. Vaughn appeared and describe how her website was a private space on the internet. And third, I will discuss the nature of her image and how its sexual nature specifically attracts a high privacy interest. I begin with the overarching principle that must guide the court in this case. And these uh, arguments can be found at paragraphs 41 to 45 of the respondent's factum. This principle says that a loss of complete control or an exposure to some risk does not negate one's reasonable expectation of privacy. I will keep my submissions on this point relatively brief. Canadian jurisprudence has consistently found that privacy is not an all or nothing concept. A person's willingness to be observed by some people does not waive their right to privacy. A person may appear in public where they can be observed by any number of others, but they retain a reasonable expectation that they will not be recorded by others in that space. Similarly, a person may lose some control over their Doesn't image. Doesn't it depend on the space? 
It certainly does depend on the space. Someone's walking down the street, isn't it? Is it a reasonable expectation that you will not be recorded walking down a public street? It certainly does depend on the space. And one of the key factors that I'll be discussing in my second submission is, is the location. Um, in a case like Jarvis, in a school where many people are recorded and um, security cameras are all around, it was still found that the um, victim in that case maintained a reasonable expectation of privacy. But I will be discussing the location in which Ms. Vaughn was recorded okay. uh, quite extensively further on in my submissions. All right, thank you. Kent, uh, will you also be addressing at some point in your submissions um, the fact that she was commercializing, the dis even in part, the dissemination of her images? I don't touch on, on that point in any great detail in my submissions this evening, and I would answer that question by noting that the Act does not distinguish between folks who share images for commercial gain and those who do it for the benefit of a romantic partner. And we would submit that that's not a relevant factor in the analysis of a reasonable expectation of privacy. So a person may lose some uh, control over their image by texting a photo of themselves to a friend, and they retain a reasonable expectation of privacy that that same image won't end up in the hands of a neighbor, a coworker, or on the front page of a newspaper. And this is especially true in the context of intimate and sexual images. The Nova Scotia legislature has made it clear through section four sub two of the act that an individual's reasonable expectation of privacy is retained regardless of whether they share that image with others. This provision does not place a limit on the number of people who that image can be shared with before the reasonable expectation of privacy is lost. And nor should it. The question remains whether the people, no matter how many who received it, knew or ought reasonably to have known that that image was to remain private. If appearing in sexualized images serve to waive an individual's reasonable expectation of privacy, privacy could only be found in those images over which somebody maintained complete control. And this, the consequence of this would be to send a message to women that they must maintain, they must keep their bodies completely concealed in order to maintain that privacy right. This would echo some of the victim blaming narratives that this court has been trying so actively to get out of our judicial decision making. Moving to my second submission, which is uh, a discussion of the location in which Ms. Vaughn appeared. We are, I'm in agreement with my friend that Canadian jur privacy jurisprudence is clear that the, lo the location in which an individual's conduct takes place is an important factor to consider when determining whether an individual has a reasonable expectation of privacy. However, the court's assessment of lo the location must be undertaken contextually. What do you say the location is here? How do you define the location? The respondent submits that Ms. Vaughn's website is a private space and if the court does not accept that, we would submit that it is at least a semi-private space. So a person may what be in the, um, and I should remember the case that he cited, but I don't. Um, but your friend uh, cited a case and, and, and the nature of the case was that you can put these extra firewall protections and you can ensure that it's a private space. But in this case, all Ms. Vaughn did was simply put some terms and conditions and ask people to agree to them and then limit the people that could have access. Don't you think she should have done something a little more to maintain the privacy associated with a private space? Respectfully, Justice, we would dispute the characterization that she only did those two things. Um, not only did she have privacy-based location uh, or sorry, location-based privacy measures to prevent people from her community from seeing her content. She personally vetted each applicant to make sure that she didn't have a personal connection with them. She then only allowed 10 people to see these specific images. And each time that a user logged onto her site, they were reminded of those terms of service, were required to agree to them. And furthermore, we would submit that the website that Ms. Vaughn has created here does have more privacy protections than the website my friend cites in, in RV Hughes. In that case, yes, individuals had to take specific steps to gain access to the content there. They had to download a, a computer program, bypass a firewall. But there was no limit on the amount of people who could download that program and bypass the firewall. Here, Ms. Vaughn has placed very strict limits on who can see her content. But let's, I mean, the, the problem as parents tell their children about the internet is you don't know who's out there, you don't know who's accessing it, you don't know what they're doing with it. I mean, surely to goodness, when once Ms. Vaughn ha decides she's going to have a presence on the internet, albeit with some restriction of, of people coming and accessing it, there would be nothing 
that would prevent, for example, a single user from broadcasting what she's doing in a room like this on the screen. And you could have 50 or 100 people uh, watching it, not the 10 that she thinks. I mean, that's not, at some point, you know, reasonableness has to kick in, obviously, because it's reasonable expectations. But can you reasonably expect that only those 10 people who are online at that moment are the only eyes that are on you? Is that a reasonable expectation these days? It is true, Justice, that there isn't necessarily anything technical on Ms. Vaughn's website that would prevent multiple viewers from watching a particular screen as one, one viewer logs onto a live stream. However, the courts have recognized that there is a difference between passive viewing, as somebody might gather in a room and, and view Ms. Vaughn's live stream 50 to 100 people at a time, versus capturing an image of that live stream and then distributing that. The reasonable expectation of privacy that we're assessing this evening is, is in the image is in the capturing of, in of the, the, image. the image. Yes. And what and, happens with that image? Yes, okay. precisely. And we would submit that Ms. Vaughn had a reasonable expectation of privacy that anybody, no matter how many watched the live stream on on that broadcast, that they would not screenshot that image and distribute because it elsewhere. Because they promise not to do that. Correct. And we all know that when people promise not to do something, they, they follow through on that. Yes. <laughs> it is true, Justice. There are, there are bad actors on, on the internet. We cannot deny that. However, we would submit that they should not be setting the standard for what a reasonable expectation of privacy is. So discussing how the assessment of location has to be undertaken contextually, it is true that somebody may be in a private space and lose that reasonable expectation of privacy. My friend referred you to the case of Milner and Manufacturers Life Insurance Co., which is a case from the BC Supreme Court. And there it was found that a woman in her own home lost a reasonable expectation of privacy because she had her curtains drawn open, the room was backlit, it was the evening, anybody walking by on the street could see what was going on in her home. And similar principles apply to the internet and online spaces. It must be assessed contextually. Just because the internet may be seen as a public place where millions can gather and see images from all over, it does not mean that it cannot be private in some circumstances. The Supreme Court of Canada in R.V. Ramelson in 2022 said at paragraph 44 that functionally, the internet encompasses the most public and the most private human behavior. It is the largest megaphone or billboard ever conceived, yet many millions also conduct private activities online confident that their information, whether touching their work, social, or personal lives, will remain as secure from general circulation as if they had transacted in public. The internet can be thought of as a spectrum of public and private spaces. Even on the same platform, we see different expectations about privacy. Take Instagram, for example, where we have profiles of celebrities and politicians who are purposely trying to maximize their reach and maximize the, the spread of their message, but we also have private accounts where people must request to follow to see any content that's shared there. People only accept follow requests from very specific people, and it is expected that that content will remain within that small group. The Ontario Superior Court in R.V. McPherson in 2023 likened that private Instagram group to showing a personal photograph album to close friends and family who have been invited into your home. On the spectrum of internet spaces, it is clear that Ms. Vaughn's site falls to the private side. Like a private Instagram, she has a small number of viewers who access her content. She's personally vetted those viewers. She established clear expectations about privacy and discretion. We already discussed the Hughes case that my friend cited to you too, and you asked him earlier about Griffin and Sullivan, but I'll remind the court here that a 2008 case from the BC Supreme Court, Griffin and Sullivan found that a website with 50 to 100 regular users, 500 infrequent users, and absolutely no limits on access, anybody could search this website. It was still found to support a reasonable expectation of privacy. And Ms. Vaughn has several more privacy measures in place on her website than the claimant did in Griffin. The comparisons that my friend makes to physical spaces are no more helpful to this court. My friend refers to A. Inc. and the Canadian Museum for Human Rights at paragraph 65 of the Appellant's Factum. And there, the federal court found that there was no reasonable expectation of privacy in a museum. But a museum welcomes hundreds, if not thousands, of visitors every day, and the only limit on entry is your ability to pay the admissions fee. And even in a museum, visitors are encouraged to talk about what they see there, bring their friends back. But Ms. Vaughn's site is very different. It is viewable by 10 of 50 pre-registered users from quite a, small, um, quite a small group that have agreed to be discreet about what they see there. 
Does it make a difference that the, at least as an argument, that her, her privacy interest is a commercial interest as opposed to an interest in her personal autonomy and, and, and sort of privacy in, the, in, in that sense? Um, because you, in most of the cases, maybe all of the cases under this uh, sort of legislation across the country, the, uh, the concern is almost invariably intimate partners where there's been a breakup and, and the information is shared. And, uh, and so it's a very, very closely held personal interest that's violated in those situations. Here, there's an argument to be made that what she's really upset for is the commercial harm coming from people getting free uh, screenshots of her uh, when they ought to come in as a member and presumably tip so that that's the na that's the privacy interest that's that's of concern here at least arguably is there do you see a difference between those situations in terms of the legislation thank you justice i do see a difference there especially in miss vaughn's case it's clear that she enacted certain privacy measures with a very specific goal in mind, and that is keeping people from her community from seeing these images. Of As opposed body. to the commercial yes, you know, precisely. financial thing that I had suggested. Precisely. I would say that this, this is about excluding certain people from seeing her body, certainly people from her own community in Nova Scotia, but beyond that, excluding anybody who wouldn't agree to her specific terms of use. It is true that she is sharing images of her body with some people for commercial gain, but that does not mean that she doesn't have uh, an interest in keeping her body private from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So, th so that argument, it seems to me, you would say it doesn't matter. Even if her interests were to be commercial in nature, she's still entitled to expect it to be private. That's correct, Justice. Yeah. Okay. That would be That's the response submission. Yeah. So, you're saying that she's entitled to do with her, do with that material what she wishes because it belongs to her. That's correct. Yes. I'll move along to a subpoint on the issue of location, and that is that the fact that that strangers occupy Ms. Vaughn's website does not negate the privacy interest that she has in the space. Canadian courts have found a reasonable expectation of privacy in spaces occupied by strangers. Griffin is one such example. On on that website, with up to 500 infrequent users. People were gathering from all over the world, often using pseudonyms. People didn't know each other's real names, and that still supported a reasonable expectation of privacy. And the law simply does not require that the relevant parties be in some sort of committed relationship to maintain a reasonable expectation of privacy. Though my friend is correct in pointing out that the Act has traditionally and almost exclusively been applied in that context, nothing in the Act says that it can only apply in that context. Rather, the purpose of the Act is broadly to create civil remedies to deter, prevent, and respond to the harms of non-consensual distribution of intimate images. According to the Minister of Justice, it is a tool for victims driven by victims. Individuals in trusting relationships are not the only ones who can be victimized by non-consensual distribution. The Act explicitly aims to protect people who are victimized while expressing their sexuality, and it doesn't dis distinguish between those who do so for commercial gain, as we discussed, those who do so with multiple casual partners, and those who do so in the context of a monogamous relationship. Furthermore, the respondent would urge this court not to discount the efforts that Ms. Vaughn has made to establish some sort of a relationship with her patrons. She set out her expectations clearly, and people go to sites like Ms. Vaughn's as opposed to consuming other pornography content that's available on the internet because they want some sort of interaction with the content producer that they're, that they're witnessing. Moving to my third submission, which begins at paragraph 69 of the respondent's factum, I submit that Ms. Vaughn's images support a high privacy interest because they are sexual in nature. At paragraph 68 of the appellant's factum, Mr. Chandler describes the images he distributed of Ms. Vaughn as containing merely details of transactions. And respectfully, such a description of the images in this case is not tenable. Ms. Vaughn's images are completely unlike the transactional information claimed to be private in R.V. Chiho, a 2009 case from the Nova Scotia Court of Appeal. What do you say about um, Mr. Maxwell's comments about, he, he'd made this differentiation of um, explicit images versus intimate images. 
Um, and, and I heard your submissions on kind of the, the trust and confidence piece, but is he not, does he not have some foundation in saying that, that um, given she was exposing herself to strangers, even if it was a limited number of strangers, the images captured would be explicit images of Ms. Vaughn, but not necessarily intimate images of Ms. Vaughn because of the audience that she was exposing herself to. Do you agree with that? With respect, Justice, my, my friend has no choice but to call it an explicit image because to call it an intimate image, which is defined in the act, would mean that she has a reasonable expectation of privacy over those images. Because of the location, because of the sexual nature of these images, and because of several other factors, we would submit that it is properly described as an intimate image and meets the definition of intimate image in the act. Returning to, to Chi Hill, the information at issue in that case was a traveler's name, the number of bags they were checking on a flight, and all of that information they had just previously given to a desk agent. That information did not reveal anything private about Mr. Chi Hill's life, and that is not the case about Ms. Vaughn's images. The Ontario Supreme Court in and Superior Court, sorry, in Jane Doe confirmed that sexual images attract the highest level of privacy protection. It is difficult to conceive of a privacy interest more fundamental than the interest every person has in choosing whether to share sexually explicit images of their body, they said at paragraph 88. And to be clear, describing these images as being intimate and sexual in nature, and thus ascribing a high privacy interest to them, is not to say that sexual activity is shameful. It simply speaks to the importance an individual must, has in maintaining control over who has access to this information. While some sex workers may choose to conduct their work in a more pu public setting, others may choose to conduct it in private and it is perfectly legitimate for them to do so. Seeing that my time is coming to a close, I'll now um, conclude my submissions by saying that I urge this court to interpret the act in such a manner that does not deny women who choose to share their sexuality with select people on a private platform, justice and compensation when their images are taken outside that relationship without their consent. I urge this court to uphold Justice Awad's decision that Ms. Vaughn did have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Otherwise, this court risks setting the threshold too high for anyone expressing their sexuality outside the confines of a monogamous relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Chief Justice Wood, Justice Gogan, and Justice Kelly. As mentioned, my name is Anu Sidhu, counsel for the respondent, Ms. Sylvia Vaughn, in the case at bar. I will be addressing the second issue on the tort of misappropriation of personality. This case is fundamentally about control. The tort of misappropriation of personality protects an individual's proprietary interest in the commercial value of their identity. Over time, the courts have expanded the definition of this tort to recognize forms of commercial value that are not tied to this concept of celebrity. And we urge this court to follow this line of jurisprudence to account for the impact of the internet. The advancement of the internet has generated the potential for individuals to capitalize on their commercial uh, value in ways that were inconceivable prior to the digital age. Thus, the idea of commercial value, and more broadly, the tort of misappropriation of personality, must be assessed through a modern lens that considers the socioeconomic impact of the internet. The respondent submits that the lower court erred in concluding that the appellant did not exploit Ms. Vaughn's personality for commercial gain, and I will make three submissions to that effect. First, the appellant's portrayal of Ms. Vaughn was primarily a commercial exploitation. Second, this exploitation was not in the public interest. And finally, an after-the-fact donation cannot convert a commercial endeavor into a charitable one. The test for appropriation of personality is set out at paragraph 79 of the respondent's factum. And as mentioned, only the third element of this test is in contention. And the respondent submits that, again, the appellant's portrayal of Ms. Vaughn does amount to a commercial exploitation under this third rung of the test. I now move to my first submission on paragraphs 81 to 89 of the respondent's factum on commercial exploitation. 
The subject infringement is more than just a commercial loss. The court in Sally and Barr notes that the harm resulting from an appropriation of personality exists not only in the form of a loss of commercial profit, but also the loss of control over whom and what one's image is associated with. The appellant's infringement... Is, is, is it an issue of loss to your client or is it an issue of gain to the uh, appellant? Well, it can be both, just as would. And well, I know, but which is the important piece? Both actually go to the determination of the test. Although it's not required for the appellant to have gained for his behavior to amount to commercial exploitation, the fact that he did gain just goes to show that there definitely was a loss that occurred to Ms. Vaughn. Is it necessary that we conclude that there is a loss to her it's as an not, element of the tort? It's not necessary. The court in Athens found that they weren't even satisfied that the public would recognize the plaintiff from the defendant's depiction of him. Um, and I'll briefly describe the facts for you there. We have the defendant, Summer Camp, who used the plaintiff water skier's image. They use a stylized version of his image in their promotional materials for their summer camp. The court concluded that they weren't even certain anyone from the public would recognize the plaintiff from the image because water skiing is such a remote sport. However, that was not necessary for them to compensate uh, the plaintiff for his loss of exclusive, his exclusive right to control that image. And the appellant's infringement also did just that. Miss Vaughn lost control over her commercial image, control which she previously exercised with great care and caution. As a sex worker, Miss Vaughn's name and image are her business. These aspects of her identity form her representational image, which then goes to the idea of representational image, which was identified in the case I was just discussing, Athens and Canadian Adventure Camps. The appellant's portrayal of Miss Vaughn functions as an endorsement. He altered the cover of his book to one of the images he took of Miss Vaughn without her consent, with her face fully visible. The only text on the cover of the book reads Sylvia Vaughn. There are no details about the author or the true contents of the book on its cover. And as a result, many consumers left reviews that they were misled to believe that this book was written by Miss Vaughn. The court in Gold, Estate, and Stoddart Publishing distinguishes between instances where a person's likeness is the subject of a work and where their likeness is used to sell a work. The former is not a misappropriation of personality, while the latter is situated squarely within the scope of the tort. The appellant's portrayal of Ms. Vaughn does not convey the subject matter of the book. Instead, it uses her as a commercial prop. In comparison, the portrayal in Gould similarly features the name and image of a pianist, Mr. Glenn Gould, on the cover of the book. However, there's a key distinguishing detail in that fact, and that is the inclusion of the author's name on the cover of the book. Now, this seemingly innocuous detail makes a world of a difference in the mind of a consumer when it comes to association and marketing, which then goes to the determinative issue of commercial exploitation. The omission of the appellant's name is the difference between a biography and an autobiography in the mind of a consumer. And the resulting but, but counsel, there's certainly, we've all been to bookstores and we see sometimes the author's name is on the front cover, sometimes it isn't. Uh, you could have a, I'm just going to use an example, let's say there's a book about the painter Picasso and you have one of his paintings on the cover and in big letters, Picasso, it may or may not on the cover have the name of the author. Is that the determinant question as to whether the person that put the book together puts her name on the cover or not? Is that the tipping point between liability or no liability? The determining question, Justice Wood, is the information available to the consumer. And now, of course, you might be able to walk into a bookstore the way someone might be able to walk in and pick up the book on Mr. Glenn Gould. However, the difference here is that the appellant's book was sold online, and the purchasing circumstances only further compound the confusion on the selling of this book. A person can't pick up the book and flip through its contents. There's no preview available online, and that works in tandem with the portrayal on the cover. There's no information about the author or the two contents of the book on the purchasing website either. The appellant also directed more traffic to the book's purchasing site by changing the metadata of his own website so that it appeared in internet search results for Ms. Vaughn's name. This parallels the circumstances in Hattigan and Farber, where Ms. Hattigan linked several domains associated with Ms. Moore's name to her own website so that Ms. Hattigan's website would appear in the internet search results for Ms. Moore's name. 
Now, the court has already classified this as exploitative behavior, as it serves no other purpose than to direct traffic to the infringing party's product off of the strength of another's name and reputation. Now, my friend suggests that the appellant was merely depicting the general idea of sex work with his portrayal of Ms. Vaughn. Do we need to be satisfied that the increase in sales from zero to a thousand was specifically because of Ms. Vaughn's name and image? Well, Justice Wood, I would submit that it doesn't matter either way, because the fact is that the moment the appellant changed his cover to use Ms. Vaughn's name, whether or not that change in cover resulted in those increased sales is not material, because there were sales after he commercially exploited her identity. But does it have to be a causal connection? No, I don't submit that it has to be a causal, causal connection because the commercial exploitation still stands whether or not there is a causal connection. Well, it needs to be for commercial gain. So does the gain have to be related to the use of your client's image? I think the important piece is that the gain occurred after the commercial exploitation. Why, and again, why is that important? That's important because I would again refer to the quote that I referenced in the beginning from Sally and Barr, where the key piece here about about the tort of misappropriation of personality is that we are looking for not just a loss of commercial profit, but a loss of control. So whether or not the link, there's a causal link between the portrayal and the, and the sales is not necessarily material because a loss of control existed at the time where the appellant gained those sales. So that causal link doesn't necessarily have to be present because the loss of control was present and the appellant profited there's clearly a commercial gain element there because he's selling a product. It's not necessary that he has to, it has to actually achieve that commercial gain. Sorry, the, did you say that's part and parcel what the court decided in Sally and Barr? Not what the court decided in Sally and Barr, but that, that quote that I referenced again, that the tort of misappropriation of personality is not just about the loss of commercial profit, but it's the loss of the ability to control one's image and what that image is associated with. The Sally and Barr case is just about an interim injunction, right? Like it's, yes. it's whether it's constituting irreparable harm or not? Yes. But the respondent submits that the conclusions that the court came to um, are still relevant to the tort of misappropriation of personality, especially considering it's such an underdeveloped tort in the country. We have to take any pronouncements we can get. Again, my friend for the appellant suggests that Mr. Chandler was merely depicting the general idea of sex work. However, his depiction does the exact opposite. The specific use of Ms. Vaughn's name and image is antithetical to a general depiction of anything. A consumer faced with the appellant's book is first and foremost looking at the specific depiction of Ms. Vaughn with the looming suggestion that there's more inside. On the other hand, in Krauss and Chrysler Canada, the defendant's depiction of Mr. Krauss was accepted as a general depiction of the game of football. However, that case is distinguishable because Mr. Krauss was one of three football players in that image taken during a live football game. His face wasn't visible, and he wasn't purposely centered or singled out in any way. In fact, the court describes Mr. Krauss as unidentifiable in that photo. The photo was also located on a spotter, which is an advertising tool released by Chrysler to connect their branding to the game of football, which then also provides additional context to the consumer. In the present case, there is no additional context or visual to decenter Ms. Vaughn on the cover of the appellant's book. I now move to my second submission that the appellant's appropriation of Ms. Vaughn's personality was not done in the public interest, which is located at paragraphs 90 to 111 of the respondent's factum. The public does not necessarily have a valid interest in every person whose identity carries commercial value. The courts in Wiseau and Gould have recognized that the public does have a valid interest in celebrities, but the existence of commercial value is not dependent on this idea of celebrity. In Hay and Platinum Equities, the court found that the plaintiff accountant's reputation had been appropriated without any requirement of celebrity. Similarly, Ms. Vaughn's identity carries commercial value, but that doesn't mean that there's a valid public interest in knowing more about her, as she is a deliberately private individual. The court in Wiseau Studio and Harper offers some more guidance on what a sanctioned portrayal of a celebrity might look like. However, the facts there differ significantly from the present case. Mr. Wiseau is a well-recognized producer and actor from his film, The Room. 
Mr. Wiseau stepped into the public eye by starring in his film, attending movie premieres, and award shows. Yet, he was shrouded in this air of mystery when it came to maybe some more personal details about his life and how he produced the film. However, the distinguishing fact between Wiseau and the case at bar is that Mr. Wiseau relied on publicity and public interest to then hold the public at an arm's length to create this sense of mystery. Ms. Vaughn, on the other hand, is not a celebrity by any means. She caps her customer base to 50 pre-approved members at a time, restricts who can access her website, and she does not market herself or her services. This is not a person who relies on the public interest to create an air of mystery. Instead, this is a person who sought out and existed in relative obscurity until the appellant shared details of her work. But there's a, there's a public facing portion of her website or else people couldn't even find it in the first instance and, and request the opportunity to be members, right? Well, Justice Wood, the public facing portion of her website is simply a landing page. You can't access any of her content. You can't even necessarily glean what kind of a website but it must it be. Is. I mean, maybe it's, I don't know whether it's in the materials uh, before the court below, but there must be something to cause people to understand what they're applying to be a member of, correct? Of course, Justice And it Wood. must have her name on it. Yeah, and the, the answer to that question further bolsters the respondent's argument. Most of the most of Ms. Vaughn's customers are repeat and returning customers, and any new customers come through word of mouth, which further goes to show how much Ms. Vaughn was not marketing herself or her services. How do we know it was word of mouth? Is that, is that, was that decided by the court below? Yes, that was decided in the okay. facts. The court in Kraus states that exposure is the lifeblood of professional sport. Professional athletes rely on publicity for ticket sales, merchandising, and endorsements, but the same cannot be said for Ms. Vaughn's profession. Instead, control over one's image and likeness is the lifeblood of sex work. And that control is precisely what the subject infringement denied Ms. Vaughn of. My friend raises fair concerns about limiting free speech and the respondent recognizes the danger of extending the tort too far and encroaching on free expression. However, that is not a live issue in the case at bar. The appellant's portrayal of Ms. Vaughn is not a contribution to the public discourse that warrants protection. The court in Wiseau recognizes that the common law should be consistent with charter values, and in this case, we must consider the values of free expression, which includes democratic discourse and participation in community, the pursuit of truth, individual self-fulfillment, and human flourishing. However, these are not the principles that are promoted by authorizing the appellant's portrayal of Ms. Vaughn. The appellant exposed private details about Ms. Vaughn and then went on to use the resulting attention to commercially exploit her likeness. This is not an example of participation in the community, the pursuit of truth, or human flourishing. Can I just add, like, I, this idea of, you know, the, the public debate over um, issues, like, like, I mean, obviously your friends are arguing just that, right? Like, they're saying that the book... Um, and, and maybe the cover didn't achieve this in the perfect way, but, but the content of the book is simply that they're bringing awareness so that the public can debate whether these types of sites and this sexual exploitation is appropriate or not. And so if, if that's the nature of the book, regardless of what the, whether the cover achieves that or not, are we not in the realm of uh, then it's not appropriation of personality? Well, Justice Kelly, the respondent would certainly agree that perhaps there are valid talking points to be discussed within the content of the book. However, the reason the respondent's argument focuses so heavily on the portrayal on the, uh, on the cover is because at the moment of commercialization, all a consumer sees is the cover. And this is a commercial tort protecting a proprietary interest in the commercial value of one's identity. Thus, because there's no, there's nothing to signify that we're having a Miss Vaughn's image is being used to have this laudable debate about sex work and advocacy against it, all we have is her image and the suggestion that she's affiliated with this book at the moment of commercialization. Finally, the public interest piece must be assessed with consideration to the social and economic context of the modern digital era. The advancement of the internet has exponentially increased the commercial potential of the average person's identity. As a result, many have turned to the internet as a legitimate way to make a living. However, it does not follow that everyone who uses the internet to conduct business is now a person of public interest. 
Running a business on the internet does carry the risk of unwanted publicity, but Ms. Vaughn's screening of her clients, customer limit, and lack of marketing has significantly mitigated that risk. Considering the reach of the internet and the billions that use it, 50 pre-approved members is a relatively modest customer base. I now move to my final submission that an after-the-fact donation cannot convert a commercial endeavor into a charitable one, and this is located at paragraphs 112 to 119 of the Respondent's Factum. My friend relies on the decision in Horton and Tim Donut Limited to argue that the appellant had a charitable cause, and thus the subject infringement can be tolerated. However, no such comparison can be drawn from Horton because its facts render it incomparable to the present situation. The court found that Mr. Horton had long since given the Tim Donut franchise license to exploit his, commercial, his personality commercially. Further, the Tim Horton Foundation had previously commissioned four posthumous portraits of Mr. Horton without objection from Mr. Horton's estate. That context could not be further from the starting point in the present case. Ms. Vaughn is far from a household name and actively avoided putting her commercial endeavors in the spotlight. Further, the appellant and clean screens are separate and commercially distinct entities, and the appellant's book is not obviously a fundraiser for clean screen. Thus, the starting presumption is that the appellant's earnings are his own, and there's no information that goes on to rebut this presumption. There is nothing, there's no information within the book or on the book's purchasing site that suggests this is a charitable endeavor. And as a result, there's nothing stopping from the appellant from keeping future proceeds of the book. But the evidence is he hasn't. So as we sit here today, the evidence is he's given it to this uh, not-for-profit organization and had always intended to do that. That's true, Justice Wood. However, we would... So it's speculation as to whether he might do something different in the future, is it not? The respondent would refute the characterization that he always intended to because there's no way to, to attest to that. He did donate... Well, let's just deal with the fact that he always has done it. Sure. Of course, Justice Wood, we can accept that the, the appellant did, uh, in fact, donate the proceeds of his book to charity. However, the reason that I raise this issue of his potential profits in the future is to highlight the fact that there is nothing stopping the appellant or preventing him from going on to keep the future proceeds. And I raise that hypothetical because at the point of purchase, the consumer does not know about Mr. Chandler's advocacy, they don't know about Clean Screen, and they don't know that this book is affiliated to either one. Thus, at the moment of commercialization, this book functions as a commercial endeavor, and an after-the-fact donation cannot transform it into a charitable one, regardless of the impellent's intention. I see I'm coming up on the end of my time here. May I request a brief indulgence to conclude? Certainly. The assertion that anyone who puts themselves on the internet in one form or, of an, or another is fair game for commercial exploitation under the guise of public interest is untenable. The court must be alive to the impact that digital ubiquity has on one's commercial personality. This case offers the court to assist in the incremental evolution of the tort of misappropriation of personality in the face of the unique challenges presented in a digital age. Thus, the respondent respectfully requests that the court overturn the lower court's decision with respect to this issue and find that the appellant did appropriate Ms. Vaughn's personality. Barring any further questions, this concludes the respondent's submissions. Thank you, Ms. Sudhu. So that completes both the appellant's submissions and the respondent's. Um, the appellants do have an opportunity if they wish to take it for a brief reply. Uh, the appellants don't wish to reply. All right, thank you very much. So, Council, you've done a, a fine job. The panel is going to adjourn, I'm going to say, for 15 minutes, and we'll come back and hopefully uh, have some answers for you. Please be seated. Council looks a little more relaxed than they did the last time we walked in, <laughs> understandably. Um, well, I don't think it will be a surprise to anyone in the room 
uh, that we found the quality of the advocacy uh, amongst all four of you exceptional. Uh, I think one of the phrases that one of the panel members used was varying degrees of very good was the you know <laughs> and then we have to pick between them so that's uh that's a challenge but uh congratulations to all of you it was uh, an exceptional job from uh, beginning to end so you should be very uh, proud of your accomplishments um i have a 15 minute decision on the merits i'm going to read before we get to the advocacy prizes if people have no objection oh i see the council want to hear that okay <laughs> well for, for, for the reasons set out in the respondent's uh, factum, we would uh, uh, dismiss the appeal. How's that for a decision? <laughs> anyway, it was... Uh, <laughs> this is much less about the merits and, and more so about the, um, the advocacy. So there's two prizes awarded for tonight. Uh, the A.S. Patillo Prize in Advocacy, which is to the two top mooters, and the Leonard A. Kitts Prize in Advocacy. And I'm going to start with the Leonard A. Kitts Prize because it's near and dear to my heart because that's the one I got when I was in the Smith Shield. <laughs> so I think that's actually the more prestigious prize myself. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that wasn't mentioned in the list of luminaries <laughs> their, their, their participation. Um, and so, so the Leonard A. Kitts Prize um, uh, this year is going to go to Michelle Maxwell and Alex Harrison. So congratulations. Join the club. Which means, in a sense, by default, that the A.S. Patillo Prize to the top mooters goes to Rachel McMillan and Anu Sidhu. So congratulations. <laughs> and it was not an easy decision, I have to say, because everybody, everybody did so well. So, so thank you all for your efforts. And uh, I guess now it's time for some photos and, uh, and a little reception. So, and thanks to the audience for coming out. It's, it's a big deal for everyone. It's nice to have the support of family and friends. And it's, uh, for those of you that are students, it's good to see the top mooters so you know what, to, uh, what the standard is to try and achieve. So thank you all for coming tonight. <laughs>